Hi everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here, and in this video we're going to be talking about how evolution is continuing, and then specifically we're going to look at some processes of speciation. So let's get to it. All right, so one of the things to talk about in terms of evolution is I'm going to explain how evolution is an ongoing process that all living organisms are undergoing. So if species or populations, and really when we think about evolution, we look at it from a population basis. When we look at a population, the question is, is that population staying exactly the same over time, or are there going to be shifts within that population? And the reality is, is that no species maintains 100% equilibrium. And even if one species seems relatively unchanged, that species is part of a, a population. That population is part of a community that's part of an ecosystem. And there will be constantly shifts within ecosystems over time, even if they're small or subtle shifts. Anytime there is a shift in allele frequency in a population, that is a form of evolution. So what we see here on the right is an example of the fact that, you know, we have two different populations. One is a prey over there, the, the mice, and one is a predator. And what we see is that in each generation, there are going to be some variations that occur within both populations. As a result of those things that we see, what we're going to end up finding is that there is a selective pressure. The predator is going to be providing some selective pressure on the prey. The prey is going to be responding to that and then putting some selective pressure back on the predator species to help determine which individuals will survive and reproduce. And as we know, in general terms from Darwinian evolution, every generation more offspring will be produced than can survive and there's a competition. And part of that competition has to do with surviving in the conditions of that environment. So let's take a step forward and talk about how populations of organisms continue to evolve. Well, we generally view that when populations change, they could do so in one of three broad patterns that we typically see. One of those broad patterns is known as disruptive selection, and that is where we have the initial population and then the average trait of that initial population is selected against. And so we see extreme forms are selected for and having two different uh, extremes, in this case, the sort of darker, grayer color and the redder color coming about and that medium tan color is selected against. We could also have what's known as stabilizing selection and that's where we see in these we'll call them reptiles in the middle and in that case the average trait is actually going to be selected for. We often see that when a population is under stress and neither of the extremes is selected for and the ones that are best suited will actually have an increase in allele frequency and those at the extreme get selected against and so we see that's called a stabilizing selection. And then what we have is on the bottom directional selection and oftentimes we see the example of the giraffe as a, a species that would have undergone selective pressure where there was an open niche to eat canopy leaves and therefore each successive generation those with the longer necks survived and reproduced and then over many generations the average neck length increased and so that's the idea that over time one extreme form would be selected for. And so those are our three general patterns we tend to see in selection. So again, all species have evolved and continue to evolve. And we know that there are genomic changes that take place over time. Those genomic changes are going to occur from both internal forces, such as mutations, and the fact that certain alleles are going to be selected for because individuals with those alleles survive and reproduce over time. We also can see that over time there's been continuous change in the fossil record. So as we go back, we do not see complete stasis of species, but we see that modern day species are different than extinct species and that those species have changed over time. The more time you look at, the more pronounced that that occurs. We also can see examples in modern day examples within our lifetime of things like the evolution of resistance to antibiotics and pesticides and herbicides. And even in the case of cancer drugs, where chemotherapy shows that the cell selection of cancer cells undergoes a very natural selection type selection against certain types of chemicals. And those cell types that are resistant to treatment will avoid those treatments. All of these things have been observed in the last hundred years since our understanding of the process of natural selection and those models of natural selection hold up 
to explain each of these phenomena that we've seen in populations. And then also we see that within an extension of those antibiotics, we also see that pathogens evolve and cause emergent diseases. And so we can look at examples like MRSA, for example, uh, that is both an antibiotic resistance staph aureus. And what we will see in that example is that the selective pressure that was applied by humans adding certain drugs into the population has led to a shift in the population of bacteria so that the pathogens are have evolved and now cause a emerging disease that is very difficult for us to treat. All right, so the question then becomes, how do new species arise? And the reality is, is that there's a variety of different ways in which we will see a new species arrive from a foundational species. We generally group these into a couple of different forms, one of which is called allopatric speciation. Allo is going to refer to different, and patria refers to homeland. And in this case, what we're going to see is that the formation of a barrier is an isolation mechanism that separates two different populations from a initial host population. And so in this case, we start with an original population, some sort of barrier is formed, depending on the size of the species and depending on what's going on with that species. This could be as simple as a stream forming, but there's some sort of evolutionary mechanism that isolates one part of the population from the other so that the genes can no longer breed and reproduce. And then as a result, we're going to get new species that can then after e equilibration will then, when they interact, you no longer see genes transferring back and forth. And as a result, you end up getting complete isolation. In parapatric speciation, what we end up seeing is that we have a partial new home or a new niche emerges within a population. So this could be a result of something like a niche partitioning where uh, you know a new food, food source becomes available, a new environment uh, appears because of some sort of change, but something new occurs. And as a result of that new niche, some members of the population will fill that niche because those individuals are now filling that niche. As a result, there's going to be those that are filling that niche reproducing only with others that are filling that niche. And as a result, you're going to see that there is going to be some sort of uh, reproductive isolation that has occurred where maybe because of a timing situation or some sort of mating behavior, over time, those two individuals no longer mate and reproduce to have young. Given enough time, that will lead to the emergence of a brand new species. And then the last case we have is sympatric speciation. Sim is going to mean same. And again, Patrick is, is going to be homeland. So within the same homeland, some sort of reproductive barrier is going to prevent those individuals from mating and reproducing. In plants, this could be something like a, a polyploidy form of a chromosome because of a mutation. And now the new form is not able to reproduce with the original group, even though they're in the same location, there's been no physical barrier, they're, they're not reproducing to produce a young. As a result of this, you start to get evolution of this new grouping that is happening within that same homeland. And even though there's no physical barrier, they're going to lead to two populations representing that same environment. And so that's our sympatric speciation. Now, when we talk about the speciation and that may occur when two populations become reproductively isolated, we often think about it as a geographic barrier or physical barrier. But as we said, barriers could be any form of blockage from two organisms mating and reproducing. It's very easy to think of this in the case of an island where, you know, some get some birds or some insects get moved to an island and now there's no gene flow back and forth in between. But there are also instances where because of maybe a coloration or a change in song or some other behavioral barrier is a form of reproductive isolation. And anytime you have a barrier where two groups are not mating and in, in producing young, you're going to have a reproductive isolation. Another example could happen during migration. And so we have this initial population and some members of the population are migrating south and some are 
going through a northern route. And what we find is that this migration pattern takes place over many generations, over much time. And it's, you know, basically we're going to keep this biological species concept. And a biological species concept is that any two members of a biological species can mate and produce fertile offspring. And so if enough time takes place between that original population and these two migrating populations, what you'll end up finding is that at the end, they may no longer mate and reproduce and produce viable offspring. And if that has occurred, then they are now distinctly separate biological species. Now, it is important to know that the rates of evolution and speciation under different ecological conditions take place. So uh, we talk about the idea of having an original population and having some sort of uh, separation where a group moves to a separate population. If the geographic barrier happens and the two get completely isolated from one another uh, and they no longer have gene flow, you may actually see that after just a few generations, that would lead to speciation. Again, depending on how strongly the selective pressure is in the two different locations. If this separate bubble that we have out there it happens to be something like an island and the selective pressures on that island are very different than the mainland, you might see in just a few short generations that there's a great enough difference that you no longer would see mating between the two groups if you brought back together. If you have some sympatric speciation, it would depend on what the mechanism is. That sympatric speciation could be something that is, you know, slight behavioral difference and you could have this blurred reproductive isolation there. Or it could be a simple case that, as I mentioned before, there could be some sort of genetic difference that we talked about before. And that would be a more profound difference and that would lead to a much more rapid speciation. Now, one of the big things that we talk about in terms of rate evolution is the concept of punctuated equilibrium. And that is when evolution occurs very rapidly after a long period of stasis. And so this idea is that you'll have populations that go along, they're in a very stable ecosystem, and then something happens and that is going to lead to a marked shift, very rapid speciation, big differentiation, big separation, leading to diversification of that original population. You can think about mass extinctions as an example of when we see really rapid evolution of diversification of groups, and that's marked by punctuate equilibrium. Not much change, not much change, major geologic event, lots of rapid change afterwards, lots of diversification. Things get very different very fast. On the right is what we call gradualism. And this tends to be a slower transitional fossils. The evidence accumulates slowly. The sharp angles that you see in the phyletic gradualism are probably going to be shown at some times. And there are times when there's more rapid evolution or more rapid diversification. So both of these models have their advantages and both have some things that are going to hold up when we look at the fossil record. The reality is, is with the vast diversity of species that we have, neither one of them is a wholly 100% accurate way of describing all forms of evolution that we see. So uh, generally speaking, the concept of gradualism was something that Darwin had strongly argued for and did not include punctuated equilibrium. And now modern evolution includes the fact that we have punctuating events that lead to rapid diversification of species that also occurs. So when we look at the divergent of evolution occurs when adaptations to new habitats results in this phenotypic diversification, again, when we look at the geologic time scale, and this is, you know, a very old school one, what we'll see is that during certain geologic periods, we tend to see massive diversification and that at certain geologic barriers, we tend to see lots of extinction events. And so in this case, what we'll find is that, yeah, during the Mesozoic, we saw diversification of all sorts of species. Our reptile groups that included our turtles and tortoises, our ichthyosaurs, really all the dinosaurs diversified during this time. And then some of those had become wiped out by the time we got to the end of the Mesozoic. And then we have other species that emerged first during the Mesozoic and then after the mass extinction during that KT boundary where the Mesozoic end and the Cenozoic began, we saw certain species like mammals really diversify, birds really diversify. And as a result of the changes from geology during time, we saw rapid adaptive radiation occur as a result of those open niches from mass extinctions. <laughs>
All right, so let's explain the process and mechanisms that drive speciation with a specific example. In this case, what we talk about is Drosophila in terms of the Hawaiian Islands. And what you can see here is that there happen to be very large numbers of unique Drosophila species that we find on the various islands of the Hawaiian Islands. And so what we find is that we started them all on one island island and then through the migration to the different islands. What has led to the diversification is the reintroduction of different species multiple different times. So for example, when I look at Hawaii, it turns out that there are 26 species of 12 different genera. And what I see here is that there were four separate major reintroductions of Drosophila to the island. So what we're seeing here is that the process of evolution involves isolating populations and the diversification as different species fill different niches, we're going to end up finding that different species are going to stop mating. And so what we'll see is that on all of these islands, there are many different species. Now we know that humans have only been on the Hawaiian Islands for at most 1800 years and the first Polynesians came in there and it's thought that the fruit fly Drosophila were first introduced to the Hawaiian Islands less than 200 years. It turns out that in just a few hundred years we have seen massive diversification of Drosophila through these various reproductive isolation mechanisms and the species diversification that have happened on these islands. And then the last concept that I want to talk about is the idea of reproductive barriers that may not be those physical post-zygotic barriers like I've talked about it, but they also could occur pre-zygotic. So you have these two individuals and those two individuals have become isolated into separate hab habitats. And so therefore they have different habitats. They don't physically meet. Or they have some sort of behavior, uh, and we know this from uh, birds or other mating behaviors. Insects have mating behaviors. Lots of species have distinct uh, mating behaviors. If you have two different organisms, whether or not they have the physical ability to reproduce, but their mating behaviors are distinctly different, they will not reproduce. And then also temporal differences. If you have, say, one type of flower that is going to flower early on in the season, produce its pollen, and then another doesn't become reproductively uh, available until months later. Well, the pollen from the first flower and the ovule from the second flower are not going to come together. So flowering at different seasons, you see this with migratory patterns. If you have two organisms coming to a mating ground, but at very different times, these are temporal isolations that will prevent two gametes from coming together. At the mating case, there could be a mechanical difference where structures of, say, the flowers prevent the pollen from getting from one place to another. This happens when we have pollinators uh, bringing pollen from one uh, organism to another. And if they physically are not going to bring the pollen in contact with female reproductive parts, there will be no joining of those. So there, there could be a mechanical isolation. We also could have a case where there's a gametic isolation where the males and female gametes fail to attract each other or are inviable, meaning that they cannot physically come together because of some separation that has occurred. Uh, and again, chemical signals are involved if a type of pollen lands but has the inability to produce a pollen tube on that particular type of flower you're never going to get the uh, male gamete and female gamete together. Now, post-fertilization, we've, we've talked a little bit about this at times, but there are times where after a separation, if two organisms come together, you may find that they no longer will produce zygotes that develop and reach sexual maturity. So if you have an isolation mechanism occurs, and then just even though the gametes can come together and fuse, if the offspring are not viable or if they're not very robust and they for, therefore where they cannot live, that would be viability, or they cannot reproduce, they can't make functioning, functional gametes, or they, they break down and they have a reduction of both viability 
or fertility, depending in some cases, that would also be an instance. We see that with uh, closely related species. So for example, horses and donkeys mate and produce mules and mules are generally will mature, but they are considered infertile. And so that is a post-zygotic barrier. And it's why we consider those two separate species. All right. I know that was a lot of speciation talk. I hope it was helpful and I'll talk to everybody soon.